welcome for Jillian Anderson. To, to talk to you. So, uh, my question to you is this. You've taken on these roles on TV and on film that have turned truly iconic. Fighting crime and defending the innocent. How did you move from those kinds of roles, fictionally, to doing it in real life with oh, the charity work that you do? Good question. Uh, well, I think it was Level, I've always been uh, an, an activist of sorts, but I think that um, that most of the time, my fear of speaking publicly about things uh, gets the better of me. And I think only lately have I been attempting to push through it and. Uh, and, uh, and speak out anyway about things despite that fact. And so y you're just hearing from me a lot more about things than you used to, I think. Basically. I think that's a feeling that a lot of us can relate to. Um, I'm obviously giving away my, my X Files fandom with my cheesy t shirt. Uh, if there's one lesson that you would want people to learn from Agent Scully, what is it? <laughs> doing this on purpose, I swear. We love you! Woo! Woo! Um, that even if you're an alien, <laughs> you can still do good work. <laughs> on the planet. On planet Earth. You can relate to that, right? <laughs> Scully has always been, you know, at, at the forefront of her pursuit of justice and truth, and um, and and that's a good uh, that's a good motto to have in life, I guess. Woo! I would say. All right. Let's see what uh, what questions we have from the crowd. Who's up first? Hi. Um, right here. Oh, hi. I just wanted to let you know that. It's me, William, and it's gonna be okay, and let's go save that. <laughs> so glad. Thank you. I, I am so nervous right now. I just write my question down in case I forgot. <laughs> so, if Dana Scully and Hank Moody, who is David Duchovny's character in Californication, were to meet in a bar, how would the interaction go? Like, would she end up throwing a glass of water like Scully did to dog it? It was the last bit. Um, what about what, a glass of water? You know how Scully threw a glass of water to dog it in season nine, season eight? Would she end up doing that to Hank Moody? I threw a glass of water. Uh, she threw a glass of water at who? To John Doggett. Oh, right, yeah. Uh, that was, um, interesting. What would his pickup line be? 
Hank Moody and Pete Wright. So who, what was that, what put Hank Moody's... <laughs> Is that what he'd say? Is that what Hank Moody says? Really? That's so lame. Uh, I think she might walk away if he said that. He might have to try that harder. Hank Moody, try harder. Hello. Hi. Um, you posted a TBT picture a few weeks ago of you in a blue dress, and you said, remind me to tell you the story. So I was wondering if you could share that. If there are children in the room, you might have to block their ears. <laughs> So, I don't know what year that was, and I don't remember how that dress came into my life. And I'm not even sure that I tried it on before the night that I was going to wear it. But when I put it on, my pubic hair is poked through the dress. <laughs> <laughs> and at that time, I wasn't particularly into the one solution, and so I chose solution number two, which was a thong. That's my story. Don't wear a jersey without underwear. And less. She has some pretty strong tape in the house. Uh, <laughs> I'll leave it there. It, it's hard to follow after that story. Um, in streetcar, when you're in the bathtub, for a period of time, are you staying in character or are you thinking of your lines? Like, what's going through your head in um, that bathtub? Well, at various times uh, when I'm, I'm in that bathtub as Blanche, I have to sing. And so I have to pay attention to what else is happening on stage. I can't go through my grocery list. Um, not that I want to, I'm, I'm joking. But yeah, so, so I have to kind of pay attention and then come in and, and my singing cues are actually very important for the rhythm of the other scene. So now I'm totally gonna fuck it up the next time I do it. <laughs> oh for the whole run now. No no no. It's all your fault. Uh, yeah so so that's what I'm thinking about. I'm I'm actually paying attention. Uh, <laughs> In your portrayal of this is very well organized, I have to say. Everybody's uh, just for the next person. In your portrayal of Scully, you've made a huge impact, especially on women, when it comes to pursuing sciences and other roles that are traditionally been taken by men. Which is If there's anything you would like to say to the new generation in general, and also for the women uh, out there who are thinking or want to pursue those roles. Who might want to what, huh? Pursue uh, the sciences and other, f in different fields. Um, well, I guess, I mean, the, the, the fact that Scully's presence on television had so much impact on, on women in medicine and science has uh, not a lot to do with me. It has a lot to do with Scully and the fact that she was an, um, um, uh, a character that people wanted to emulate um, in many ways. But I think that uh, I've suddenly started to realize, and I think when I, um, just a couple of days ago, uh, myself and, and some other people were at the UN talking about issues to do with human trafficking. And, and there were... Um, 
uh, you know, questions ever asked, and it suddenly occurred to me in that uh, moment when I was asked to speak again that um, y yes, that women have had that reaction to characters that I've played, and specifically to Scully, but that reaction is a reaction of um, choice. You know, to choose what one wants to do with one's life and the school one wants to go to and, and the path that one wants to follow. And one of the reasons that we were there was to speak about and for many millions of people on this planet who don't have a choice. And of course that goes beyond people who are actually in modern day slavery, but, but you know, millions and millions of others. But that, I guess I would say today that um, if I were to hope that somebody would take something away from whatever it is that I may talk about at any point, it's the fact that I'm attempting to, to lend a voice for the voiceless, to the people who don't have an opportunity, a chance, a, um, you know, any public space on this planet to be able to stand up for themselves. And, and to um, emulate an activist, somebody who goes out and tries to make a difference, whether that is in um, one's hometown or within a school or within you know community or in the greater world, that that so many of us have so many choices today, and and um, how great would it be if in one way or another in our lives we all attempted to be that voice for somebody who didn't have one. And so that's what I guess I would say. Hi, um, thank you so much for being here and for your activism as well. Um, I love your t-shirt. <laughs> it will be auctioned at the end. <laughs> so, this is an election year, and I'm wondering, who would Scully vote for, and who would Mulder vote for? Hillary? Bernie. <laughs> Probably. I would imagine. I would imagine? Good answer? <laughs> Hi. And the cigarette smoking man would vote for Trump. Hi, you're very beautiful. Why, thank you. I've been a huge X file since episode one. Thank you. And my question for you is do you believe that aliens have visited, are visiting right now, or will be in the future? Um, I believe a lot of things. Uh, I don't know, some days I think that they might be walking amongst us. Uh, um, <laughs> most of the time I have a tendency to believe that there are parallel universes. But then some days I think I'm insane, so... It could all be true. <laughs> so you ask that question again next time and you'll get a different answer. Hello. Hello. Uh, welcome to Utah. Been a fan of your work. Thank you. What? Actually, I've been here before. I came here a lot as a child because I have family here, um, some of whom are Mormon. Oh, sorry. Is that a guitar? Are you going to serenade me? I'm the president of the world. I'm just here to pause about and bring happiness to the, to the world. You're the president of the world, did you say? Pretty much. Okay, okay. Anyway, I remember a track that I did. You collaborated with a group called uh, How? I did, yeah. For a track called Extremis. How did that come about? Because I really dig that track. So, I'll take my, I'll take my answer off the line now. Thank you. Um, I can't remember. I think... I think it was related to a series that I did for the BBC about space. <laughs> 
and it's possible that the soundtrack was done by Hal, <laughs> and that at some point they asked if I'd be willing to do like a spoken word track, and I said yes. <laughs> and then we shot a video of me watching robots have sex. <laughs> I think that's what happened. <laughs> a day in the life. Just another day in the office. Yes. So I love your t-shirt and actually- I love your t-shirt. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, everybody wanna see your t-shirt? It's an I Heart Scully. I Heart Scully t-shirt. Oh, and you heart Mulder. This is, this is my roommate, she loves Mulder. <laughs> So my question is actually, I've heard rumors that you and David Duchovny didn't get along very well when you first started filming The X-Files, and if that's true, what kind of changed and made you guys the friends that you are now? Um, well, we did get along. We got along for a long time. There were, um, there were periods during those nine years that, um, that we got along less than other times, and uh, <laughs> But it's, it's not really that complicated. We were, you know, shoved down each other's throats for nine months a year. And so, um, you know, it was like having, it was, we were siblings, practically, sort of. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and shit happened, so yeah. So, but then it was never, like, and then we grew up, <laughs> I guess. Or just time and, um, time and, and I think realizing that actually during that period of time we were essentially the only people who might have understood what whatever it was that we might have been going through at any given time and, and that hey wouldn't it be nice if we got along um, but I don't know whether you know literally that thought occurred to either of us it was more of just nostalgia over time and fondness growing and maturity and you know we're gonna die soon so we might as well be friends <laughs> basically so i was wondering as a redhead how did you like being a redhead for the show are you red i am pretty oh, dark oh yeah you are you are damn red uh, <laughs> I think it was um, it was hard to hide when I was a redhead at that time, and um, and I like hiding, and so it's easier to hide as a blonde. Um, you know, I thought for a second that uh, that if we did do more episodes, that I might actually dye it, despite that all my hair might fall out. Um, but then I don't know if I want to be standing in, Star in Starbucks as a redhead. You know, because you guys might come up to me and start talking to me. <laughs> and I don't like talking to people in general. So, that's a dilemma. But I think about it sometimes. But thanks for asking. <laughs> Hi Jillian, um, I as a kid watched a few X-Files, liked them a lot, and so I decided to pound through the first season, became more of a fan, and um, I was just wondering at some point... How old are you now? I'm 36. Okay. Yeah, but um, at some point in your life did you... Have you seen all the seasons or no, a couple uh, seasons? No, no, but I, I will, don't you worry. <laughs> um, anyways. <laughs> Uh, I was just curious though, at some point where you either burnt out from the X-Files or at some point where you're like, can you just let me believe you because, you know, Scully, that your character didn't... Did you call me? I'm oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> Scully. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Um, <laughs> sorry, did I pronounce it wrong? No, no, no. Okay. No, no. Okay. Um, Scully would have, um, I don't know, th there was a point when I uh, called Chris I don't know what season it was, uh, maybe a few times, and said, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> How could this go on? How can I keep, you know? Real, I, 
it just, and um, he said, but here's the thing is that it has to, that that dynamic has to be there in order for the show to work. And so I go, okay. And then, you know, another year would pass and then I'd call and go, for fuck's sake. <laughs> Episodes came along, and there was a slightly different dynamic, and and there were other things that she could believe in, or in a different way, and could potentially be more open-minded, etc. And it still seemed to work a little bit, but yeah, th there was definitely a point when I thought, um, "Get me the hell out of here!" Many times, I think. But that's human, right? <laughs> My question for you has to do with the reboot. Yeah. Um, the character that plays your mom leaves you a necklace with a quarter in it. Do you know what the symbolization is of that or that particular quarter? Um, no, I do know that there uh, that it was a um, something that happened in the writer Glenn Morgan's life, where there was something that was um, possibly even. His mom had left something behind that he, that clearly had a lot of meaning. I, I could be making this all up, but I think <laughs> that that's where that came from, that something was left behind that he had absolutely no idea what its meaning was for her and it was clearly meaningful and he had no way to ever find out. Um, um, but I, I think the point is in that episode is that we don't know, which is hard, for audiences in this day and age to not know things, um, but a fact of life that that there are just some things that are that have huge question marks and are completely unknowable. And as frustrating as it is, there is some kind of mystical uh, beauty in that, um, in the mystery of it, um, and tragedy at the same time. So, um, but no, I don't know why specifically a quarter. Sorry. <laughs> Hi, um, I was just wondering what it was like working with Mads Mikkelsen on the set of Hannibal. Um, Mads is uh, really handsome. <laughs> and um, uh, he's an incredibly intense uh, actor to work with. Um, there's more going on behind Mad's eyes when he's acting than than most actors that I've ever worked with. He's he's it's very very curious to watch to be looking into his eyes when you're working, um, and so that was you know we had a pretty intense working relationship just sat across from each other for so long having these um, these scenes and it was. It was, you know, it was joy. It was fun. It was it was a joy to work with him, and um, wonderful to have somebody so intense to play off of. And um, and he's just he's a really nice guy. So. Hello, I'm actually pretty new to the X Files fandom. I just started watching it about a year ago on Netflix, and I'm about halfway through season seven right now. Um, wow. I really enjoy it. Uh, I was curious, there's a lot of the episodes that are kind of more supernatural in nature uh, and have kind of like the monster of the week going on that are pretty creepy and frightening. Uh, so I was wondering if there's any episodes that you think are particularly creepy or frightening to watch or if you had any creepy experiences making some of those. Um. Really, that creepy working on something because you're you're in the midst of the technicality of it, and you see the, the prosthetics and the fake blood and the and everything. Um, so it was more more a matter of reading them for the first time and realizing pretty early on that I needed to read them in daylight. Um, and I don't know if I've ever. I mean, I used to watch them. I, I never really watched them in retrospect, but used to watch them when they would air live or shortly thereafter. 
Um, but when you're so involved in something, it's really hard to be surprised. I did. I have to say though that I did um, with the whatever it's actually really called, but the Band Aid Nose Man. Um, right? I mean, he just ripped the bodies apart behind him, and yeah, that that was pretty freaky. I have to say. Um, but that's uh, that's about the extent of it, I think. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Or... Um, hi. Oh, hi. I was curious if there was any aspect of the X-Files that you had wished had gone differently. <laughs> that is a great question. Oh, boy. Um... I can't answer that, honestly. <laughs> you just have to trust me on that. But that's a really, really good question, and I so wish I could answer you. <laughs> There's a garlic! I was just curious, when you did your voice acting on Princess Mononoke, what was that experience like for you? Um, incredibly frustrating because um, the Japanese actor who played him originally was a transvestite. And so for the life of me, I was trying to have a deep voice. <laughs> and I tried really, 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 really hard and it just wouldn't, it just didn't, it, I couldn't get to that same register and so, um, and so it always felt like I, I wasn't doing Moro justice with my squeaky voice and um, so, yeah, so the, yeah, that's kind of the reality of the situation. I mean, I, I, I love Miyazaki's films, they're some of my favorite films of all time and um, uh, such an honor to be a part of them, but um, yes, I, I don't feel like I, I did, I wish I knew the transvestite's name actually, but I don't feel I did her justice in reenacting her performance. <laughs> what was that? You did fun! <laughs> talk show I was doing, or maybe it was a radio show, and I was done and was walking out and there was this group of people and one of the guys goes, uh, he yells out to me, hey, I love some of your work. that if you went back and watched it, you thought it would be so strange and unexplainable. Wait, I actually can't concentrate right now. How old are you? Twelve. And how old is your sister? Eight. Can you see the, this little... You're so cute. So, can you, can you tell me first why you're a Dalek? I don't know. <laughs> No. You sound like a toilet. That's very, very good. Um, wait, can you please just tell me how you ended up in that outfit? I wanted it yet. Okay. That's good enough for me. Okay. Your sister has just taken all of your spotlight. I'm so sorry. What's your name? Um, Brianna. Brianna? Mm-hmm. Hi, and you're 12? 
Yep, and where are you from? Um, I'm actually from Tooele, Utah. From where? I'm from Utah, I'm like 45 Did you say minutes. Provo? No, I said oh. Tooele, it's 45 well, minutes out of the city. <laughs> okay, and so you come here to the Comic Con to do what? Um, me and my family like to come here because it's fun and my dad absolutely freaked out when he knew you were coming. <laughs> Oh, you wanted to? Okay. And where's your dad? He's somewhere over there. He should be wearing... Wave, wave, dad. Coward! Now, it's a pleasure to meet you. I'm very glad that it's you standing up there. So, I'm sorry. What is your question? Um, was there ever an X-Files episode that you filmed that if you watched it again, you would think was so weird and unexplainable? Well, most of them are pretty weird and unexplainable. Um, I mean, there was, there was, <laughs> there was that one about the evil cats. I mean, there were so many like that. It just happens to be the one that I remember because I've got a sieve for a brain, but you know, there was one about evil cats, and and Scully uh, gets attacked by a cat, a few cats, something like that. And um, I don't remember anything else about the episode, but I don't know. Is there another one I should be talking about? Were there any that were like particularly, particularly just weird, stupid weird? seen home. <laughs> um, but yes. Yes, that would be, uh, yeah. Um, I wonder what the actress is doing today who played the mom who was under the bed. <laughs> she should come to Comic Cons. Go back and say hi to your dad for me. So I think this, uh, I think this is going to be our last question so that Jillian has time for her t-shirt auction. Okay. Uh, there's a countdown clock here. There's a countdown. So. Hi. Hi. Um, I've been a huge fan of The X-Files and yours for a long time. Um, that being said, I've had an opportunity to watch a lot of what you've done, including the bloopers and outtakes. Oh, let me tell you that the outtakes that are going to be on the X-Files DVD for the short stack we just did are, are pretty, pretty fucking funny. I'm very excited about them. Anyway. I also got to see you in Streetcar, and oh. you are flawless. You're perfect. Thank you for How seeing you it. Go from um, being, being the goofball that I am to <laughs> well, basically, when you yeah. know you don't have a second take coming, how do you oh. get it so perfect when on TV your bloopers are awesome? <laughs> <laughs> so when I'm on stage, how do I do that when I make so many mistakes on TV? <laughs> I've never thought about that. Um, I think part of it is, and I'm so superstitious, but part of it is that uh, you just do it so many, so many times that, that you can, or you want to have done it so many times that you can basically do it in your sleep. And there was a moment that happened I'm so afraid to tell this story because I'm afraid just even thinking about it will make me go up when I'm on stage. But there was something that happened during the run in London 
that was almost impossible to come back from. Um, Vanessa Kirby, who plays Stella. <laughs> and I... <laughs> this thing happened, and it was so funny that for the rest of the play, I had an image of it in my mind <laughs> and had to push through that image, every single speech, every everything. It just stayed there, this image. And but literally on the verge of hysteria through the whole rest of the play, and it was torture. Even when I think of that image now, it makes me want to throw up. <laughs> So I'm really hoping that something like that doesn't happen again. Um, so, um, this is a t-shirt. Um, and some of you know uh, where it originated. I'll explain for those of you who don't. So, David and I were on the Jimmy Kimmel show. And, and um, Kimmel asked uh, about our previous relationship while we were filming and asked us to give some kind of an explanation as to why we might not have gotten along. And for some reason, I, I started talking about I was attempting to talk about how long it took um, for my hair to be done between takes when it was so, I use the word moist, so moist in Vancouver, meaning, you know, damp, moisture in the air, frizzy hair kind of thing. And, um, but I, unfortunately, I couldn't stop laughing. And then the whole thing just became really ludicrous. And then there was something about the hallway that we were auditioning with and David referred to it as the anteroom and then so this thing began with moist in the anteroom and it doesn't even really seem that funny anymore. <laughs> but, um, and actually it's also occurring to me that this is highly inappropriate for the money that I need to raise. <laughs> with this t-shirt is going to be for the Taught Not Traffic Fund. Which is a really amazing fund that's been set up to help keep girls in Nepal in school because it is determined that if girls are schooled until the age of 16, they are 80% less likely to be trafficked into sex slavery than if they weren't in school. And also the devastating statistic that, well, there's so many devastating statistics, but the fact that there are some uh, towns, villages in Nepal now where there are no children left because they have been kidnapped and, um, and are presently in slavery somewhere, uh, most likely in India or other places in Nepal, or that 1.8 million children get trafficked a year. Um, this t-shirt, uh, whatever we raised today, uh, will go towards the Toddler Traffic Fund. And um, so, I guess, are, are there people out there who would, are interested in bidding on that? Just can I get a sense of that? Yeah, okay. Um, should we go up in 50s? I'll start at $50. 50, 100, 100, oh God, I'm not gonna be able to do this. 200? That slowed you down. Um, 300 over here. Was that a yes? 300? Anybody for 400? No. 350? 350? Do I have more than one 350? 400 bid from backstage. A 450 from backstage? <laughs> oh, 400 from backstage? 500? 600? This is the 600? Anybody from more than 600? Remember, this is this is that shirt. The one she
she's wearing right now. Yeah, this is this shirt. What? 700. because um, they will screen it for you if it's not going to show up there and all that kind of stuff, but thank you. Keep waving those lights around. 